recording one. The broadcast is now starting. There we All go. attendees are in listen only mode. And welcome to Exploding HIPAA High Tech Myths, except no substitute. My name is Carlos Leyva. I'm the CEO of Three Lions Publishing, the publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Um, before we cover the agenda, just a little housekeeping. Um, we will be sending out the slides, the registrants, after the webinar. Okay. Uh, we like to have a complete list um, of people, of attendees. Well, actually, um, we send them out to all registrants, whether you attended or not. But we will be doing that shortly after the um, uh, webinar finishes. Please check your um, spam folders or junk folders, because sometimes the PDFs wind up in there. Um, and then if you absolutely don't have, uh, can't get them, email us at support at three lines publishing.com we'll make sure that you do get it now uh, another housekeeping item we're going to take uh, like we normally do we're going to take questions um, that you're burning to ask during the webinar and and so you can type in the chat and, and Martin will collect those uh, and at appropriate times either he'll interrupt or I'll ask him if there are any questions and then we have a formal Q&A session at the end um, so with that, let's get started. So what we want to do is uh, explode and debunk certain HIPAA compliance myths. We've listed some here, wetware versus software, agile versus heavyweight methodologies, small versus large organizations, covered entities versus business associates. And we have others that I, uh, I wouldn't say I threw in, but I, that I'm aware of. And so these are things that come up all the time and it seems that uh, despite the fact that the omnibus rule is you know we'll be approaching a year old in September and the High Tech Act has been out four or five years there just seems to be a lot of myth making that continues in the HIPAA universe and some of it um, some of it is readily understood just by all the changes that the healthcare industry is going through and I think some of it is just sheer resistance to uh, regulation and the change that the High Tech Act brought about vis-a-vis uh, -vis the old HIPAA, which was just a paper tiger and uh, never really enforced. So uh, it, it's um, sometimes disappointing, I guess, for us that that work in this space, that it's taken this long sort of to, to uh, get to where we're at, but it, I think it is what it is. Um, and there is progress being made. So what where versus software? What do you mean by that? Well, this is our definition here. Wetware is a biological gray matter contained in a fixed medium. It's suitable for other humans to consume. It's um, not software. Okay. It's wetware is what you need to know in order to comply with high tech HIPAA. So it's, you know, this is um, clearly a shameless plug because this is what we think we do is provide educational products that help you understand and are unlike the HIPAA regulations and unlike NIST or any tools that come out of HHS and ONC, our tools are definitely prescriptive. We definitely tell you how to do things and so um, it, 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 I'm, the, we're trying to make the distinction here between telling you how to go about it. This is step one, step two, step three, and giving you some guidance so that you can get started model policies versus um, software. So we think wetware, from our perspective, is a knowledge transfer vehicle. Uh, its focus is on education. Software, generally, uh, not only compliance software, but other kinds of software, right? Software is where you store and manage your visible, demonstrable evidence of high-tech HIPAA compliance. Um, in the case of accounting, something like QuickBooks Online, software is where you store your visible demonstrable evidence that you're accounting for your business correctly. It's, it's a repository, partly, and it's a uh, engine that helps you do certain things better, faster, cheaper, etc. Okay, but 
we're trying to make the distinction that one is not the other. QuickBooks Online doesn't teach you how to do double entry accounting. Okay, if you want to learn how to do double entry accounting, you need to go find different resources. So compliance software should be much more than a file repository. It should help you to effectively manage your initiative. In other words, there are other ways that you can get a file repository for your compliance documents. There, you, you could do it on the cloud. You can do it using Google Apps. You can do it using SharePoint. And really, if you had to, and you're a small practice, you could do it on a network share. Right? And we actually have a repository that we help um, that we define. Here are the folders that you need. Here's where you should uh, put certain documents. Right? That, so if if software is just providing that, then then you have to really uh, question what what you're getting for your money. If software is helping you drive your business, if it's the engine that helps you comply, if it's helping you with alerts and tracking mechanism, things like that, then that's a different story. So that's what you ought to be paying attention to. Now, the reason why this is a myth is that, well, first of all, compliance software without wetware is just an empty container. Okay, If you don't know what to do, then the software is not going to help you very much. If you don't know anything about accounting, just the fact that you have QuickBooks, you know, it's not going to help you all that much. But beyond that, wetware itself is um, self-contained, right? This is the product. You don't really need this other stuff. Software actually requires wetware. And here's the challenge in the myth is that a lot of compliance software is often sold as wetware, okay, where the compliance vendors are going to say, oh, yeah, we have some forms, and oh, yeah, we have some templates. But they're not in the business of keeping up with all the changes in the regulation and updating their documents and updating their um, checklists and their frameworks and their tools every time HIPAA changes. What they're in the business of is selling software. Okay, and so you have to be really, really careful what it is that you're buying and what it is that you're selling when you when you purchase compliance software. What you really want uh, is a combination of both. But generally, what you're going to find is that vendors are going to specialize uh, either in software or wetware. Now, Martin, any questions there? I know the. I mean, I'm, we're introducing new terms. Is wetware is, you know, just something I love to do. I throw out new terms that seem to make sense for me. Do we have any questions on that? Not at this time. Okay. Whoops, wait a minute, something just popped up. Let's see what we got here. Would you make the same recommendation on any training? And I think we're talking about compliance training here. Um, well, if the question is if the vendors are, are, are um, if the software vendors are providing some training, um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not going to name names because you know it's up to you to do your due diligence. But I do know for a fact that uh, there have been more than one compliance software makers that have contacted us and wanted to integrate our wetware into their software. Now, we've entertained those ideas, but we um, have chosen not to do it, not because um, it, it wouldn't make sense at some level, but it, it, generally the, the compliance um, vendors want to uh, private label it, take all our brand branding away from it. and. Uh, that's not something we wanted to do, and even if we did want to do that, then it would mean stripping all that out of our products, and it would create a nightmare when things change. So let me just give you an example that when the omnibus rule 
came out and changed everything, went into effect September 2013, we went through and changed every single one of our products uh, because of the omnibus rule, omnibus rule, because it touched some a lot more than others, but it touched almost every single one of the products. I think everyone had to change. And we had to go through and change those and note what, and note what ha had changed. Right, because that's the business that we're in. I, I, I can assure you that the compliance vendors probably 100% almost did not do that, because that is not the business that they're in, and that is a a, a pretty painful thing to do. Uh, you know, so a lot of them uh, are, are either relying on some old templates or have you know thrown together some templates. But when things, when major changes occur, don't go back and do that. And I think the same thing would apply to training. When things change, you got to go in there and update. And in training, is especially hard to update because you're, um, you know, in our case, you're, we're talking about re-recording videos, right? And so it's not just modifying some documents; it's re-recording what we've done. And if anybody's ever uh, done some of that kind of content generation, you know that it's time-consuming to do. So, uh, you know, the caveat emptor is really something just be sure that you're aware of when you're out there in the marketplace, what it is that you're purchasing. Um, a couple people got in a little late, and a quick definition of wetware would be is requested. Okay, so let me back up. I'm not going to go through all this, but well, maybe I will real quick. Wetware is biological gray matter in, contained in fixed medium, suitable for other humans to consume. It's not software. Uh, it's what you need to know in order to comply with HIPAA. It's really a knowledge transfer vehicle focused on education. Software is where you store and manage your visible demonstrable evidence of compliance. It's kind of a repository. Um, and compliance software without wetware, without uh, knowing what you're supposed to do is really an empty container, and the analogy I used is just because you bought Quicken doesn't mean you know how to do double entry accounting. Those two things are, they're two uh, separate learning curves, two separate things, right? So wetware is self-contained where software really requires wetware. And this is the point that we're making. Be careful of what it is uh, that you're buying because a lot of the compliance vendors are actually saying they have wetware, but really what they're selling you is software. So be careful. That's your uh, legal warning. I think that's okay. I've gotten you caught up now. Do we have some more questions along these lines? Yeah. The question is, what exactly is your product? This is our second presentation from you, and I still have no idea what you're selling. <laughs> well, that's a great question. I wish more people would ask about that. We actually do a shameless plug. We have a subscription plan where we have about 25 or 30 products that we sell. Um, I've lost count now because we, we our, our main product is a subscription plan that um, sells for 795 a year, and you get all our products, and you get all the updates to the products. And then um, for a renewal year, uh, it's 495 a year, and it's optional. But what do you get? We have about 10 or 12 uh, training modules. Um, you know, everything from the core training, privacy rule, security rule, uh, breach notification rule, business associates, specialized training, what happened in the omnibus rule, how to launch a compliance program, on and on. And you can go out to our site. Uh, you can go to the HIPAAsurvivalguide.com, uh, and on the left-hand corner, you'll find this little coffee cup, and you can click on that. And it'll take you to store.hippasurvivalguide.com. At the end of this presentation, there's the URL. But you can go out there and buy most of our products individually. Uh, although we, we, if you price them individually, they would probably be about fifteen hundred, seventeen hundred, or you can buy all of them for seven hundred ninety-five and get the update. So, for example, uh, well, every time we introduce a new product, now if you're a subscriber, you just get that product. Okay, and we recently introduced how to launch a HIPAA compliance program. Okay, and that training, uh, uh, video based. Each all of our training modules have a quiz and an answer key. So the the um, emphasis on being able to 
use that to train your entire staff, train individuals, and then help you generate visible demonstrable evidence of compliance. So you can create a spreadsheet that says, yep, you know, Johnny was trained on this particular day, he took this particular training, he passed with a score of X. And if you ever got audited, you could produce that spreadsheet of all your training. And so our products come with uh, tools, spreadsheets, things like that that help you uh, track some of the visible demonstrable evidence that we suggest you should um, you should be tracking. That's an so training an example. Uh, our checklist is not you know this rudimentary sort of uh, simplistic checklist. Our checklist for the privacy rule goes through every single requirement of the privacy rule, gives you a suggested policy, gives you a suggested set of processes that you should implement that underpin that policy and gives you suggested mechanisms and sometimes we actually provide the mechanism uh, as, especially for small and medium sized practices to actually track process results. So we'll give you the statement or the paragraphs for your training policy. We'll suggest how you should implement the process you, processes you should implement for training and then we'll give you suggested mechanisms for tracking uh, training results. That, that's one example. That's one requirement. And we do that for every requirement of the privacy rule. And if you follow that methodology, what you end up with is visible demonstrable evidence of compliance, which is really the only thing that's going to allow you to make a good faith argument of uh, that you're actually moving along the compliance continuum from willful neglect to a, a good compliance narrative. And a good compliance narrative is just the ability to show, demonstrate over time that you're getting better and better at producing visible demonstrable evidence of compliance. So um, the store, and I, we're actually doing the shameless plug at the end, so I'll, I'll stop there unless there's more questions along those lines. No, we don't have any more at this time. Okay, so what we mean by agile versus heavyweight methodologies is um, and, and agile methodology is iterative. It's something that lets you get started quickly. Um, it's not formal, static, academic. It, it, it's intended to, to um, start getting you results right away. And, I, and hopefully, uh, I'll be able to uh, make some comparisons here that will make sense. And some of you that are compliance officers and have been at this compliance game for uh, a longer period of time will uh, will be able to relate. Um, a heavy methodology you might think is uh, uh, like ISO 27000, for example. It's got all these rules. It, it, it's a generic sort of uh, security framework that could apply across industries, uh, etc. And it probably takes you three or four months and thousands of dollars not only to buy it, but or uh, but but to become educated in it that that's just not that's not launching your compliance program that's just understanding ISO 27000 okay and so we're going to get to an example we'll start with agile so um, it turns out really that navigating the regulatory maze has proved daunting for organizations of all sizes now confronted with HIPAA 2.0 which is no longer a paper tiger and that's why probably most of you are here is that you know that HIPAA now has some bite and the methodology approach that you select at the beginning is likely to be determinant of how much progress you make and probably determinant of whether you, you launch a successful uh, program or not. So it turns out that most projects fail because of people and process challenges that have very little to do with the underlying technologies, despite the fact that there are some complexities here to do risk assessments, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, across the board, these these it's usually the people and process challenges that will cause you to fail. For example, the security rule implementation, which the first time you read the security rule looks like some kind of CIA specification for security, and it's probably where you know the the White House got it back in 1996 when the Clinton administrated administration promulgated it. Uh, the security rule implementation is much more aptly described as a change project really just going to change the way you think about compliance. And now that compliance is no longer a paper tiger, now that you can actually get serious fines, now you actually have to contemplate what this thing is, and you have to struggle with this beast and hug the monster 
uh, but it's going to be a an, organi an organizational change project. It's not just something you can throw over to the IT organization and say, hey, you techies go do this. It actually has organization-wide implementations, and it has organization-wide implementations with respect to learning how to manage risk. And that's the change project, learning how to manage risk as an organization is what a security rule implementation really is all about. So an iterative agile methodology is required, and now we're going to try to define, okay, so what exactly is that? So that's the $64 million question. And I'm just going to run through these definitions and platitudes, and hopefully we can, uh, you can get a, begin to get a, a um, sense for what agile is. It turned out that Agile was a, a something that came out of urban, the, the original work came out of urban planning um, back in the 40s around something called wicked problems that we'll talk about in a second, a few slides. And then, then it was really borrowed by the uh, software industry in a very, very big way. And all kinds of agile methodologies now dominate software. And now it applies to almost anything. And we're just using uh, agile now in the compliance context. So. Agile compliance, it's a group of methods based on an iterative and incremental approach where compliance solutions evolve. Okay? Agile promotes adaptive planning, evolutionary development and implementation, rapid and flexible response, especially in operational environments that are quickly morphing like healthcare. And we're going to run through this laundry list of changes that uh, are happening in the healthcare industry and are going to continue to happen in the healthcare industry. So the operational environments are going to continue to morph. You're going to need something that allows you to quickly respond to this amount of change and the pace of change. Agile is a conceptual framework that basically acknowledges that due to the change in operational, technical, and regulatory environment, the implementation cycle never ends. At the end of the day, agile compliance is what we believe is how an organization goes about changing its compliance DNA so that you can be 21st century compliance ready. And it's kind of embodied in this uh, quote here from Tom Peters, which is a really like a 30 or 40 year old quote. I think it was either um, Thriving on Chaos or his previous book. But fail forward fast means the quickest way to succeed is start doing something, learn, what from, learn from your mistakes, pick up and get started again. And right instead of um, naming the committee, the, the uh, forming a committee, the name a committee to study the problem to death for six months. Just get started working on the problem. And the reason that fail forward fast works is because compliance, like law, like a lot of problems that we face um, in our world today, are wicked problems in in uh, terms of difficulty and not tame problems, and I'm going to describe the difference between the two. So fail forward fast is the only effective way of solving a wicked problem. And wicked means here difficulty, but a special kind of difficulty. Wicked problems have an inordinate amount of social organizational complexity in addition to technological complexity. And it's the social organizational complexity that really makes the problem wicked. So a wicked problem has these characteristics. You don't really understand the problem until you started developing the solution. I guarantee you that you don't understand if you're just getting started with the new HIPAA 2.0, you're just getting started with the security rule, you are clueless as to how what you're going to wind up with. You don't even understand the nature of the problem that you're trying to solve. So the best thing you can do is to get started because that's how you're going to improve your understanding of the problem. And until you improve your understanding of the problem, there's just no possible way that you're going to solve it. There's no stopping rule. Since there's no definitive problem, there can be no definitive solution. So some of you might say, wait a minute, there's a definitive problem. Yes, the definitive problem is this. Thou shalt comply with the HIPAA security rule. Thou shalt comply with the HIPAA privacy rule. Thou shalt comply with the HIPAA breach notification rule or the high-tech breach notification rule. That's about as definitive as the rules get. They don't tell you how, they tell you what the requirements are, but they don't tell you how to go about complying, right? They're descriptive instead of being prescriptive, and that's by design. 
they're never, the government is never going to tell you how to do it because then you're going to make the argument later, oh, wait a minute, I did it just like you told me, and now you're saying I'm not in compliance. They're not in that business, and NIST is not in that business. So we're, we'll talk more about the tools that ONC and NIST puts out, and they do, they do have their place, and we all tend to use them as a reference, but they are prescriptive. I mean, they're descriptive and not prescriptive. So if you don't have a, a, a problem defined, then solutions are not right or wrong. They're just better than others or worse or good enough. Okay? Every wiki problem is unique and novel to your organization, and every solution is a one-shot operation. So you pick the wrong approach up front. You bet on the wrong horse, and two years later, you're probably updating your resume and, and hoping you haven't had a major breach and getting out of town. So it, it's critical to think about the approach you're going to use to attack this uh, wicked problems. Now it turns out that big problems like launching a HIPAA compliance program require small solutions. Now this may be counterintuitive, but it's not that the ultimate solution is going to be small and trivial. It's that the ultimate solution is going to be built up of a lot of small, robust solutions so that you learn to uh, produce visible, demonstrable evidence better and better over time. And how do you do that? By getting started. You get started on requirement one, you go through that, you say, okay, what's our policy? What's our processes? Is this really what we want? How are we going to track this thing? Oh, okay, I, I'm starting to get this tracking stuff. Now now we got to, you know, now we can do a better job maybe on requirement two. And you can also, but at the same time, you're making progress. And you can also show that progress. One of the things that we have in our um, product is what we call scorecards that list every requirement of the privacy rule, list every requirement of security rule, and let you go back and check off and say where we're at. So here's the one thing that our program, our subscription plan is, is designed to do is to move you from no story where you're in willful neglect land, and that's where the biggest fines are, to a place where you can at least make a credible good faith argument that you've gotten started on the problem, you haven't ignored it, you haven't thumbed your nose at the government, and you're making a good faith effort to comply, and if you can make that argument, you're probably not going to be found in willful neglect, okay, because full compliance is some aspirational goal that you're going to be working on for three or four or five years, so big problems require small solutions. So this is what you don't want to do. You don't want to form a committee, and name a committee to study the problem. What you want to do is get busy and get started, okay? Heavyweight compliance is, on the other hand, focused on well-defined, otherwise known as tame problems. And it has a model that looks like this. This is the risk GRC model, governance, risk management, compliance. It's kind of a formal academic model. It's what's been used in the industry for a long, long time. It's kind of a static model. And here's the difference. Here's the difference between a tame problem and a wicked problem. Bridge building, it turns out, is a tame problem. Is it, is it trivial? No. But we've built thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of bridges uh, during the time that man has been on the planet. We understand the mathematics of bridge building. We understand the physics of bridge building. It's not an unknown problem. It's a tame problem. We know how to go about doing bridges. On the other hand, standing up a HIPAA compliance program within your organization has all kinds of social organizational complexity with the docs going this way and the compliance officer going that way and HIT consultants pulling the other direction. The organizational complexity of the problem dwarfs the actual technical aspect of the problem by orders of magnitude. That's the difference between a tame problem and a wicked problem. And I'm going to stop there, uh, Martin, see if there's anybody. Got some additional questions. No one has asked anything at this time. They're always free to ask, and I'll bring them up. Okay. So what, you might think. What is the so what? Well, here's the thing. We now live in a different world, in case some of you have been asleep at the wheel for the last 20 years. And the pace of innovation is accelerating. Now, healthcare used to be this industry that was kind of, you know, uh, insulated from all this change, right? It, 
it's just it was a different beast. It just all these changes that had taken place, the internet and you know mobile devices and I mean all these things just you know had not really touched healthcare in a meaningful way. But the pace of innovation is accelerating. All industries now are competing in time, and the risk now uh, after the High Tech Act, the risk attached to high tech compliance is real significant and growing each day really as the healthcare industry moves toward electronic health records, right? This is one of the, the biggest changes uh, that was driven by, uh, primarily driven by incentives from the government and now I think it's just the cost of doing business and the price you pay to play the game. Pay for performance, so business model, healthcare business models are changed and driven by um, the Affordable Care Act, Accountable Care Organizations, etc. ICD-10, um, how you bill is is uh, being introduced, although it keeps being deferred. Now all these things are happening, the Affordable Care Act, at the same time. Quality measures, you now have to report in order to get paid for performance, paid for outcome, uh, you know, something that the healthcare industry has never done. So whereas you could figure out if you wanted to buy a PC, what a Dell would cost you, what an Apple would cost you, what a uh, HP would cost, try figuring out what the same procedure would cost you in three different hospitals and you know first of all that's that, that's a price measure you couldn't even get that let alone quality metrics as to success rates for those procedures that's now changing it's changing because Medicare who's one of the biggest payers is requiring and driving that change same thing with pricing transparency mobile health and bring your own device mergers and acquisitions that are probably going to continue to accelerate in the healthcare space, especially with as ACOs uh, mature, the use of telemedicine. You know, and here's the latest buzzword, big data and analytics, and big data, um, you know, we, we've done a complete webinar on, on big data. Big, big data is essentially analytics on terabytes, petabytes, zettabytes of data that will help you manage population health. And accountable care organizations now are not just responsible for, from a reimbursement perspective, managing the disease symptoms of an individual. The whole business model is being flipped on its head, and uh, well, it's the way it's always should have been, but it hasn't been that way. Is that they're re now responsible for pay for performance, managing the health of populations, which is really managing wellness instead of managing illness. So. Net net um, is the healthcare industry is going through 150 years of change in five. We have a, a question that came up, Carlos. Can you give some examples to make this more concrete? I am a consultant to a public health clinic that is going to be using EHRs and billing for services. I have to make clinicians, clerks, lab people, management begin to make the operation the operation HIPAA compliant. Um, so, let me see if I understand the question. You're not asking the, the individual's not asking the question about about um, big data or any of any of this. No, thing. this came in right right before the big data. Okay. Well, first of all, you know, um, if if that organization is still relying on that three ring binder that uh, they, that everybody had prior to the High Tech Act. And they're going to be in willful neglect. If they had a breach, um, they're they're probably going to get fines that are willful neglect fines that start at fifty thousand dollars a pop. Okay, so um, you know, at a minimum, you have to go through and have changed your policies, your procedures, and just about everything you were doing. Because let me just say this: prior to the High Tech Act, HIPAA was an unenforced paper tiger. No one ever got whacked for anything. It was dirty little secret was. Hey, as long as you had your privacy policies, your notice of privacy practices and all that, paid lip service to it, you were good to go, okay? But nobody ever vetted what you were doing because government uh, essentially didn't enforce it. The High Tech Act was meant to change all that. It, 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 it uh, provided for stiffer fines. You can now have millions of dollars worth of fines instead of $25,000 being the max, which was the max under the old HIPAA and, and almost no one ever got. 
And if you find a breach, there's going to be a mandatory investigation. And if there's a mandatory investigation and uh, HHS finds that you've done nothing since the High Tech Act, then you're going to get whacked at w the willful neglect here, which is $50,000 per violation, up to a, hundred, a million and a half for identical violations. And so there's no real limit to the amount of fines that you could get. And about three or four years ago, Signet got fined. $4.3 million for refusing to provide access to PHI to 20 patients because HHS found them to be in willful neglect because access to a patient's PHI is something that's been in the privacy rule forever. Okay, But since organizations were never required to comply, a lot of these processes are just in the, in the regs and the, and the organizations are really blind to them. And the other thing that's happened is is that patients have been got have, have become a lot more sophisticated in what their rights are, and so are beginning to ask for some of these things. Now, you know, if if your challenge is to make them HIPAA compliant, I got to tell you, I mean, we can do the shameless plug, you know, for 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 seven hundred ninety five dollars, you go buy our stuff. You're going to get training. You're going to get model policies that you can distribute right away. You're going to get access to agile compliance project plans. I think we have about 20 of them. So in addition to giving you the tools, we say here, if you're still is struggling with where do I start, start here. Right? And the very first thing we say is, is a place to start is update and distribute our model policies. For example, how can you sanction an employee for not complying with the privacy rule if your employees don't even know what the privacy rule is? So if you distribute these, the policies and get employees to sign that they read and understood the policy, and if you trained all your employees on the policies, then you can start to launch a program. So we have these many project plans that say, hey, this is building block one, building block two, building block three. Now, you don't have to do them in the order that we suggest. It's agile. You can pick whatever order you want, but you know, but that, that's what we do. That's your challenge is how are you going to grope with this complexity that's a monster? You know, are you going to, um, are you going to join high trust, which is, uh, and buy the, you know, buy into the high trust framework, which is called cost you thousands of dollars to buy into that program, I think, and thousands of dollars for education, and it'll probably take you six months to, to a year to figure out what high trust is doing, you know, and so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using a little hyperbole here but to make the difference between what agile is and what, um, uh, what a heavyweight methodology would do, and it, it, it's an inordinate in a complex challenge. So I don't know if I can, in the space of what we're doing right now, we have lots of webinars that we, we cover these other topics, but uh, if you have a more specific question, uh, uh, try, I can try to address that. Uh, there are no more questions, but I was just going to add this. Uh, Scarrett County, uh, Washington, uh, maybe a month ago, uh, in their public health um, initiative, was fined uh, two hundred and fifteen thousand dollars for either ignoring or not complying with certain parts of the HHS reg regulations. Actually, I think they did both. They 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 got fined, right? And then they ignored what they what what HHS told them to do. And HHS came back and said, "Well, now we're going to whack you harder." So anyway, look here's here's the here's the what's happening in the industry. Um, from a just business perspective is that every healthcare organization now is trying to get on the next innovation curve, okay? Uh, because if you don't get on the next innovation curve, eventually you flatline and you go out of business. And so what's being revolutionized right now is not, not only compliance and all these technologies, is the healthcare business model. So we believe that only Agile allows you to quickly jump the innovation curve that, you, that healthcare organizations and, and actually business associates as well are all trying to do to get to the next innovation level, really to keep from going out of business. Agile is the only way we believe that helps you jump the curve in a way that's consistent with all the other change uh, that is going on and avoid eventually avoid a death spiral. So agile versus heavyweight. Uh, heavyweight is define all the requirements up front, learn them all, test all the requirements, make sure you got them all covered, integrate all the requirements and the workflows. It's what we call big bang, big bang compliance. You're going to do it all at once. And it's really, really a slow feedback loop as opposed to agile, 
which is define, test, integrate, verify. Define, test, integrate, verify. Define, test, integrate. Keep repeating these processes, walking through our tools and our checklists, and so that you get better and better, but you start delivering results right away. That's agile compliance, and what the benefit it has is it has a fast feedback loop. So you're learning more about the problem because you're implementing it quicker, and you're actually making mistakes faster, fail forward fast, and you're correcting those mistakes much faster, and that's how you eventually build a robust compliance program. So I'm going to leave this chart here for... Uh, those of you that are interested, when you get the slides, you can kind of go over a summary of Agile versus Heavyweight Compliance. This is our um, program methodology that we've adopted from a, a NIST framework, uh, risk management framework, and it's got five steps for a risk, a HIPAA high-tech risk compliance um, program. Assess, simplify, protect, monitor, report. Assess, simplify, protect, monitor, report. In our launching a program and in our Agile compliance training, we go through each one of these steps in some detail. So again, you know, it's not um, just prescriptive. It's actually telling you how to go about implementing uh, these steps. But the key here is that you're going to be repeating these steps uh, over time. But Agile is going to be eventually eventually will be what you say it is. It's how you iterate. It's sort of tools uh, and a methodology and a way of thinking that you're going to adopt to the needs of your organization because each organization is different. So that's sort of one uh, um, myth that we wanted to explore, agile versus heavyweight. Now, small versus large organizations in this case. And the bad news is, despite what um, HHS says with the scalability of the security rule and the flexibility factors and all that kind of stuff, there is no HIPAA light for any organization. There's just no way, and we'll describe some differences uh, shortly, but you know, everybody wants that, that magic silver bullet, and that magic silver bullet doesn't exist. You're going to have to hug the monster and really dig in to comply. There's just no HIPAA light available, which means there's no magic button that an organization can press. Can't buy even our templates and just change a few things and boom, create a new three ring binder that you're now going to use for compliance. It doesn't work that way. The world has actually changed. It ain't that simple. Now, it's not as hard as people imagine it to be, but it ain't this simple and it's never going to be this simple again. Okay, so the security rule's built-in scalability is a myth. The, the security rule has um, certain flexibility factors that are trying to adjust, adjust, uh, adjust for size of the organization, financial resources of the organization, technical sophistication of the organization, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, for all intents and purposes, it's a myth. And I'll tell you why. It turns out the compliance requirements for organizations large and small are going to be similar on a relative basis. Yes, there's more to do if you're a large hospital versus a small ambulatory practice, but the burden is probably relatively the same based on the size of your organization. And let me back up a little bit and explain to you, as many of you, um, we're not trying to cover this. This is not a security rule um, webinar, but let me spend just a few minutes here on required versus addressable implementation specifications that are in the security rule. So you see a, um, and by the way, the full text of the regulations are available in the HIPAA Survival Guide. The full text of um, the High Tech Act is available. And in our products, when you click on a reference to a regulation, you actually get taken to the complete source on, on the HIPAA Survival Guide. So you can see what the entire regulation says, or a really a subsection of the regulation. But the, um, the any required implementation specification and it, it, the security rule is set up with standards, then every standard may have one or more implementation specifications. And each one of those implementation specifications are going to be either required or addressable. Okay? And if it's a required implementation specification, then you have to implement it 
period, end of story, you just got to do it, okay? Large organization, small organization, business associate, you just got to do it. Now, if it's an addressable implementation specification, then here's what you get to do. You either have to implement the, the specification as is, or you have to in, implement a reasonable and alternative, a reasonable alternative to this implementation specification, or you have to have a compelling reason and document that compelling reason why you've decided as an organization that there is no reasonable and appropriate specification that you can uh, implement here. No reasonable and appropriate specification. And good luck with that argument saying, yep, we looked at it. First of all, you have to look at it. You have to study it. You have to either implement this specification or an alternative or come up with a compelling reason why you can't implement anything. And you're going to be hard pressed, large or small, to find a compelling reason why you couldn't do anything. And if you can't find a compelling reason, then the security rule and the privacy rule, but security rules especially, is filled with these weasel words that say, you better implement reasonable and appropriate processes, tools, etc., to protect your PHI. Reasonable and appropriate. What does that mean? Well, you know what? Uh, no one knows. But sooner or later, it's going to be the federal courts that decide, decide what that means. And so that's the tool that you'll be hung on if you will just if you're just going to ignore the addressable implementation specifications. Now, that's not to say, and we're going to cover this in a little while when we talk about BAs versus CEs, that's not to say that there aren't some instances where you can't say it uh, for an addressable implementation specification that, hey, you know what, this doesn't apply to me, but you can't ignore it. You have to document what, what you did, your analysis, and then come to that conclusion and then be able to support that conclusion. Any questions there? Not at this point. Okay, so covered entities versus business associates. This comes up all the time because obviously business associates are now on the hook for the three legs of the High Tech Act container. The HIPAA privacy rule, the HIPAA security rule, and the 800-pound gorilla that was introduced uh, by the High Tech Act, the breach notification rule. Okay, S business associates are on the hook statutorily for all three legs. Period. End of sentence. You're just on the hook. Not only uh, are you on the hook contractually with your BAA, with your covered entity, you're on the hook statutorily, which means that HHS and some other sheriffs that were enabled by the High Tech Act, state attorney generals, and actually some other sheriffs that have shown that they also have jurisdiction, like the FTC uh, and even uh, the Secret Service, uh, depending on who's knocking at your door, may decide to exercise jurisdiction, um, and you will be on the hook for them. Now, there is a difference here with respect to business associates. So the business associates that store and or maintain PHI have a relatively equal compliance burden as their covered entities. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you're an EHR vendor, you're an EHR vendor and you store PHI, obviously, on the cloud. If you're a cloud-based, SaaS-based, software as a service-based uh, EHR vendor, then you're storing and maintaining PHI you're going to have to implement the security rule 100%. Dot every I, cross every T, encrypt if you want to take advantage of the um, breach notification safe harbor, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? You, you have about as high a compliance burden as any covered entity. Okay? Now, if you are a BA that doesn't store and maintain PHI, then you have a less of a compliance burden than your respective covered entities. You know, what does that mean? Well. Business associates can be lawyers, consultants, um, software vendors that, that do tech support for you, on and on and on. Okay, So as a lawyer, if I only look at your PHI when I'm at your site and I never take the PHI to my office, I never email it back, then I could make an argument that, you know what, there's parts of the security rule that I really don't need to implement because I don't store and maintain PHI. 
The only time I get access to it is when I go on site and I review it on site. Okay? So there are some things that I could do as a lawyer. First of all, this applies to lawyers and lawyers, consultants, uh, accountants, all that, all those examples are listed right in the regulations. So, you know, I'm not just making this up. These are the little guys. They're still on the hook. They're still business associates. You still, even though you don't have to comply with uh, all, you may not have to comply with every addressable uh, specification. You still have to comply with every uh, required implementation. And you still have to show that your people have been trained, that you've been trained, that you're aware of how you should be protecting it. You have less of a burden, but that burden hadn't gone away, right? So this ups the ante for everybody. Big BAs, medium-sized BAs, and small BAs. But there are differences. There are definitely differences, and it, it, it definitely can scale a little bit. But this is the point. However, even BAs that don't store and maintain PHI can escape from the compliance burden altogether. If you want to be in this game, if you want to play, then you got to pay. And the price you're going to have to pay is becoming more literate as to how you protect PHI consistent with the rules. Um, questions there. Quickly, with the end of Windows XP Pro as an operating system receiving security updates, would a CE or BA be considered as non-compliant from a review standpoint? I believe this might fall into the addressable realm. Well, here's where it's going to fall into, um, you know, it is is not updating um, the OS, not updating the operating system. And, and you know what? Um, there were a lot of people that loved XP. Um, Martin and I, um, more Martin than I, but Martin and I are, are part of that because XP was stable. It worked. It's like, why, why do I need Windows 7? Why do I need Windows 8? It's a whole, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so I, I understand the resistance, and I also understand the cost. Uh, of upgrading, training, et cetera. And, and you know, um, it's not like dentists and doctors and other people don't have other stuff to do, right? When you change the OS, it, it changes their behavior and impacts them. So, uh, but the question is going to be, uh, if Microsoft is going to deprecate XP and stop providing security patches, uh, the question is going to be not whether or not you're, you're um, in compliance just because you didn't upgrade. The question is going to be if you had a breach or you had some audit, right, uh, is that going to be um, considered to be reasonable and appropriate for your organization? Now, you might be able to make an argument that for your size organization it was reasonable and appropriate given the capital investment of where you were, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's assuming nothing really bad had happened. If, if you uh, and this is just the way it is, right? There's the rule and then there's the reality. If you experience the major breach because XP uh, hadn't been updated and, and there was a flaw that would have been prevented had XP been updated, then good luck trying to make that argument that it was reasonable and appropriate with um, doing what you did by not upgrading, okay? So it really is going to depend on, it's not going to be per se, you know, you're going to get whacked. It's really going to depend on what happens as to how hard you get whacked. And that's the real, if you want to boil down the real, real big difference from an enforcement perspective, is there's two ways you're going to get caught now, and, it, and it's not going to be an audit. Even though audits are going to start in 2014, even though, you know, HHS is going to announce a methodology, it's probably going to be some sort of random selection methodology like the IRS, and it's going to, eventually include BAs of all sizes, although maybe not right away, but right away covered entities of all sizes, small, medium, large, et cetera. But, you know, I mean, how many, how much resources the HHS, they can't really get to everybody. But there's two ways you're going to get caught. You're going to have a major breach of, uh, that you got to report because of the breach notification rule. And if it's over 500 patients, you're going to wind up on the wall of shame. And if you have a major breach, there's going to be an automatic investigation. Or you're going to have one or more patients complain to HHS. And if in that complaint, like Signet, it's obvious that you're in willful neglect because 20 patients complain to HHS that Signet 
the idiots wouldn't give them their PHI when they requested it. HHS got that complaint and says, well, these guys are willful. What do you mean they're not giving you the PHI? All right? Either one of those two things are going to happen, and that's how you're going to get caught. So if you want to be fat, dumb, and happy like the dentists right now, then go ahead. But sooner or later, you're going to pay a price uh, for that. Now, Martin, I think I digress. So help me out here. What was, what was the question that I was trying to answer? Uh, the question was, my favorite product, XP, no longer has security yeah, there you uh, go. updates. There you go. Okay. Is there anything else? No, not at this time. Okay. So, well, let me stop here. <laughs> Dentists are, um, they're strange creatures because HHS almost never talks about them. They are definitely a healthcare provider. They're definitely a covered entity. And, you know, I mean, they are more clueless than even the most clueless docs as to whether or not they should comply. Now, I think, uh, you know, that the dental organizations nationwide and even local have be probably become more literate, but they're just trying to fly under the radar, and that's probably going to last until the first dentist experiences a major breach, and then all of a sudden the dentists are going to wake up and say, Oh man, I'm a covered entity. I need to comply as well. Uh, and you know, for whatever reason, it just historical reasons, is HHS just didn't focus on. I mean, they never said anything about dentists. They they've always been covered entities, but it was just like, ah, we don't worry about the dentist and all that. And the dentists, I think, have decided just to continue uh, flying under the radar, you know, for uh, for as long as they can. But I think. Sooner or later, they're going to have to be. Uh, they're going to, they'll, they'll be brought into the 21st century, and likely for the same reason: major breach or somebody's going to complain. Okay, what about the tools that HHS and NISP put out versus commercial tools that can help you um, actually implement the three-legged stool? Well, I caught some flack a little while ago when I said that. Uh, H HHS or ONC shouldn't uh, shouldn't fall into the information technology trap because um, they uh, had a press release that they were going to uh, release this tool that the complaints that they had heard about was that small practices weren't doing risk assessments because you know it was just too complex and they didn't have the tools and so uh, ONC said well we're going to we're going to deliver this tool, and before they delivered it, it was like I posted out on the HIPAA Survival Guide LinkedIn group, which I encourage you to join. There's, I think, close to 3,000 members now, and there's a lot of great conversation out there. Uh, you know, I said, you know, ONC, ONC shouldn't fall into this trap for two reasons. First of all, small practices are not implementing the rules, not because they don't have the right tools, because they don't want to spend the time or the money. There could be great free tools out there and they still weren't going to be doing it. It's not it's not a software uh, tool problem. Okay? And two, what kind of tool is ONC, and I'm going to get to NIST as well, what kind of really valuable tool were they going to produce? If First of all, they're not in a software business, so if they're going to produce a really, really valuable tool, they would be completing with commercial tools, which they can't do. They're a government agency. And they're not going to get the kind of resources to invest in that. So I caught a lot of flack, like, well, what else should ONC do? And I'm like, you know, what ONC should do is enforce the damn rules and stay out of the software business. It's not their purview. That, that's what they should do. And so they, rela they released this, this tool about six weeks ago. I downloaded it. I, I spent an hour. I couldn't figure out what the damn thing would do, except it looked like it was trying to help you create an inventory of your assets, which is something you got to do to do a risk assessment, but you could do that in a spreadsheet. In fact, we give you spreadsheets to do an inventory. And then beyond that, I couldn't, I couldn't honestly figure out. And I've used a lot of tools, um, lots of software in my professional life, a ton. I use them on a daily basis. I, I spent a good hour. I could not figure out what this tool did. So, you know, if you're waiting around for HHS to solve your problem, good luck with that. And they, it's not going to happen now. Probably about a year ago, and I'm not, and I'm, 
here's the here's the thing. I'm trying to make a distinction. NIST has a lot of documents out there called the 800 Special Publication Series that almost every vendor references. We reference it, almost everybody else does. Okay, um, and they, they have some value, but where they're not valuable at is that they, for example, they have a, a implementing a security rule guide. It costs you nothing. Encourage you to get it and read it. But for every every uh, uh, requirement of the security rule, instead of telling you how to go about doing it, what they do is to say, here's the thir here's the twenty or thirty questions that you should be asking with respect to this requirement. And you read about two of those, and you're about ready to pull your hair out, right? Hey, I don't want a hundred and a thousand questions to ask. Why don't you try giving me just a few answers and let me get going here? All right. And so, ask twenty questions. First of all, who am I going to ask them to? And now you're now you're talking about some consultant engagement that's probably going to cost thousands of dollars and it's a big, long, heavyweight process. In other words, the NIST tools are good reference tools, but they ain't going to tell you what to do, and they're never going to tell you what to do. But a year, a little bit more than a year ago, NIST decided, well, we're going to offer a tool that helps people with, um, I think it was a risk analysis or maybe it was implementing a security rule. And all they did was offer a tool that helped, that asked, you know, that was a piece of software that asked those 20 questions per requirement. So I got to ask, and I know this isn't a, you know, we got like 60 some odd people on. Is anybody out there using these tools? Has anybody out there even looked at these tools? Don't everybody raise your hand at once. Martin? Martin? I'm here. I'm looking to see. Uh, going through everybody. One, two, one person. Okay. Two so far. Two. I got you. So let me ask these those two folks. Did you guys get a, a tremendous amount of value? I mean, maybe you're maybe. Oh, you're here's some. Uh, I'm sorry. Coming that that was on the hands up side. Uh, coming through on the question and answer question side is. Um, I look briefly. Nope. Nope. Reviewed. Yes. Using no. Same conclusion as you. That's from an IT support provider. Tools provide on HS. They're too confusing. Tried the NIST tool. That's pretty much all it comes down to out of all the people. That yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to bat. I mean, it was a noble attempt, right? I mean, they had their hearts in the right places, I guess. But they're not going to produce the kind of commercial tools that are really going to be useful to you. So my point, and, and one of the reasons I caught a lot of flack is, if you're not going to provide a useful tool, then why the hell are you providing anything at all? You're just wasting our taxpayers' money. You're not doing anything because nobody's going to use that junk because it's unusable. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, again, caveat emptor, yeah, free is free, but good luck trying to use some of those free tools that are out there. Now, this is something that's come up recently. HHS is not the only sheriff on the block. First of all, the High Tech Act empowered um, state attorney generals to bring suit on behalf of their citizens. So you could have like you know twenty twenty uh, you know twenty patients in Jersey uh, complain to the New Jersey um, attorney general, and he or she could bring a suit on behalf of those twenty individuals. Still can't bring a suit under HIPAA or High Tech. They never could. But here's what happens, and here's where the weasel words reasonable and appropriate creep back in. If there's a major breach, I'm talking 500 or more, um, you can almost expect you're going to have a class action lawsuit. And one of the questions is, well, wait, how can you have a class action lawsuit? Individuals can't really bring lawsuits under HIPAA high tech. That's true. But the class action law firms aren't bringing it under HIPAA or high tech. They're bringing it under state negligence law. And they're going to make an argument that what you did was not reasonable and appropriate. And if you had XP and, you know, the, the bad guys exploited XP, they're going to say, you were negligent. And you need to pay our patients, our clients' money because you didn't, you didn't meet the standard of care. You didn't do what you were supposed to do. So anytime there's a major breach, you can almost be guaranteed there's going to be a class action lawsuit. The FTC has jurisdiction under certain cases. Uh, and... 
the FTC will argue they just have a um, jurisdiction under the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission Act, okay, to protect. The, the, right now, they're the ones that protect privacy, um, privacy with respect to websites. And you know, if, if Facebook is violating their privacy policy, it's the FTC that comes calling. Obviously, not HHS, but you know, uh, other organizations have gotten in the game. In other words. If some organization like the FTC, and, and there was one case recent where it was even the Secret Service is calling on you for some reason, is visiting you, then that could easily turn into a HIPAA audit unbeknownst to you. Uh, it doesn't have to be HHS. Here's another topic that's come up that's getting a lot of press, whether you should buy cyber insurance or not. And I think there's going to be just a lot of people, a lot of organizations that feel like they have to buy cyber insurance because they can't afford, um, it's, like, it's like not having catastrophic health care insurance, right? You just can't afford not to have it because any health care catastrophe is going to bankrupt an individual or family. Uh, etc. And so a lot more um, insurance companies are getting into this game. The, the question is going to be what are they going to require to see in order to, um, you know, get reasonable premiums. They're probably going to want some assurances. And if, if you've never worked with insurance companies before, you know, uh, you're going to find out that they really hate to pay. They, they're going to have, uh, and, and the policies themselves are extremely complex. They got notice requirements that if you fail to meet, they won't pay. They got all kinds of fine print that tries to get them out of paying when they're supposed to pay. And they got an army of lawyers ready to defend them. So you got to make sure that you, if you buy the insurance, you really understand what you're getting. You understand the notice requirements of the policy. You understand what the policy is going to cover, what the policy is not going to cover. And one of the things that I can assure you, because these policies never cover, is reputation damage. All right? You have you have a, a breach like Target, and well, you're not going to get anything from your insurance uh, provider for the damage to your brand and the billions of dollars that you just lost on the stock market because your your stock went from 50 to 5. There's no kind of protection that, that's going to uh, uh, allow you to do that. And you're certainly not going to get any protection. Uh, well, it remains to be seen how much protection you might get from a class action lawsuit, et cetera, et cetera. So my warning would be, yes, you probably have to have it. But again, be careful. Caveat, covered entity or business associate, be sure that you understand what it is that you're buying. Questions, Martin? None. Okay. It's a quiet crowd. No, I think some of these things are just food for thought. You got to go think about them. So, you know, cost of compliance versus cost of non-compliance. I can tell you that the cost of compliance is really small compared to the cost of non-compliance. Over time, I believe that the, the healthcare industry, even small practices, will come to um, determine that, you know what, if I just complied, if I just got started, uh, that it, it, wa it wasn't the monster that I thought it was going to be. First of all, a lot of the things in the security rule are, is really IT 101, passwords. and th I mean, these are things you ought to be doing anyway. These are things you ought to be doing as part of what you do uh, because you're in business, because of part of what you do because you're trying to protect the data that's really important to uh, the service that you deliver to patients, right? It's one of the things you should be doing so that Katrina or some catastrophe like Katrina doesn't completely wipe out your business, right? In the 24-7, uh, 365 online universe that we live in, you ought to just be doing a lot of these things, right? And so, you know, the cost of compliance vis-a-vis -vis the cost of non-compliance you know, it could be from a few thousand dollars to millions of dollars. Um, and, and certainly big enough breaches and, and the amount of data that can fit on a phone or a laptop or a uh, thumb drive now is, is enough uh, 
to put somebody out of business. The fines are, are, are that steep. So this is something that, that the industry, that we need to have a more of a conversation about. Okay, I'm going to run through the shameless plug since there was a, a person that said, well, you know, I've attended a couple of these webinars and I don't know uh, still what, what it is that you sell. I don't spend a lot of time on a shameless plug. I won't spend a lot of time here that covered most of this, but you can go to store.hippasurvivalguide.com and you can see, um, you know, and if I was feeling brave, I'd click on it right now, and I will. I never do this uh, in a live webinar, and so I'm sure the computer is going to blow up. But you can go to uh, store.hippasurvivalguide.com and see all of our products and um, see the subscription plan, what's covered, and watch. Um, um, product videos um, that will describe what it is that you're doing. It, you can also go and so I just launched a browser since I decided to take the sleep. I don't know if some other browsers um, come up here. We'll see how quick, quickly we can do. Uh, if you if you go to the Hippo Survival Guide, soft, well, first you're going to see a video of me. But you can click off of that, and you you, you can go to the store by its coffee cup. That's another way that you can get there, and that'll take you to store.hippasurvivalguide.com. And um, you can list, you can look at our products, and here's on this particular page is the entire set, uh, and then you can click for more details on our subscription plan or in any one of these products, and on the bottom you you will get. Um, product videos. The reason I'm scrolling is all the products are also listed on the footer. So you can get to them on the footer uh, as well. So if you click on, for example, uh, let me go back up here, see details on the subscription plan, uh, you'll see a video uh, introducing what is in the plan and a list of the products uh, that are available for the $7.95 and some things that are only available to our uh, subscribers so uh, that is the store um, now each one of the products where there are references to the regulations actually take you to the regs as I described earlier and that's something that really our competitors uh, can't do because they don't have a site like the Hip Survival Guide uh, and we like to believe that we provide the recipe we tell you the steps to go through not just the ingredients uh, we provide educational products that you can start executing on day one, and they're agile ready, agile compliance products. You don't have to study them for a year before you can start getting results. Really agnostic as to business associates or covered entities, large or small organizations. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, you know you don't have to make some. We provide you the source, you know, the PowerPoints, so you can modify. And you are, you are going to modify. You know, organizations are different. We can't have a solution that solves everybody's problem, but we give you the basic tools so you don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel. Um, okay. If you don't have any questions now, you can email questions to support at threelinespublishing.com, and I try to be, uh, and Martin tries to be as responsive as we can be. Uh, if you have some questions now, uh, we can take more questions. We had about. Um, we have a question and a comment. Okay. The comment is, your your candid honesty is absolutely refreshing. That's addressed to you. With respect to what? <laughs> well, I would have to assume. I'm not making any friends at Owen, at HHS. I don't think, but. Yeah. Well, I would assume that, that you're putting it out there as it is. There's no sugar coating. There's no this is easy. There's no HIPAA light, and there's no easy button. So, that's being candidly honest about what they're dealing with, in my opinion. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, second question, or se second item on here. Uh, will you be having AMA Friday soon? You know, we uh, we tried twice now to launch AM. I mean, we didn't try to launch. We actually did launch it. We I launched it about a year and a half ago, and it, we just didn't get the kind of audience. You know, we were getting ten or twelve people. Um, 
and frankly, we were just getting a lot more mileage. There's only so many hours in the day that we can do these things, and we were um, uh, we decided we just couldn't do it for that that small an audience. So unfortunately, I got to tell you that uh, AMA Fridays um, have gone bye bye. Now we um, we do have our newsletter that's free uh, that we've been doing for five years. So we got uh, we're one of the leading uh, newsletter uh, providers out there. If you just Google HIPAA High Tech newsletter, we usually dominate the front page on Google. So you can readily get signed up. We, we do that monthly um, and we do these webinars at least once a month and that's how um, uh, you can stay plugged in. Now if you really want to stay plugged in though, I would say join the LinkedIn um, HIPAA, compliant, HIPAA Survival Guide group because I, I'm out there almost on a daily basis but uh, I'm not the only one that's out there. There's just a, a really good conversation going on uh, in that group with lots of knowledgeable people and uh, if you want to stay plugged in and you got some questions you can throw them out to the group and usually uh, you'll find somebody that will be responsive. That, that's pretty much it with questions. There are a few other people that agreed with uh, your being candid. So, uh, Well very good. Thank you for listening. Again it's been um, our pleasure being with you today and stay tuned for the next one.